Hi there. Hey. Hello. Welcome Hello to there. From Scrubs to Scrubs. I'm Alicia. And I'm Charlotte. And we are two medical students trying to figure out our place in medicine by looking to the past and to current events to better understand the impact they have on us as women in medicine and women in general. Yeah. And you can find or follow us on this or find or follow us on social media. We have an Instagram, Facebook, TikTok, which are all at From Skirts to Scrubs. We also have a Twitter or X now, as it's called, at, which is at FSTS underscore podcast. And you can also check out our website for more information in our episodes, show notes, sources, and more at FromSkirtsToScrubs.com. And we now post on YouTube live recordings of each episode. So be sure to follow us on YouTube as well to see our episodes every other week. Yeah, and you can also subscribe to our podcast and leave us a rating and review. Apple Podcasts is the best place to do that, but you can also leave us a five-star rating on Spotify. Yeah. And welcome back to episode 60, everyone. So, so excited. I can't believe it's like actually episode 60. Wow. Now it's really sinking in. We definitely have more than 60 episodes, but this yeah. is like the literal number 60 when we don't count our mini episodes and bonuses and all that stuff. So we're so excited you guys are all here and excited to jump into this new topic. So this week we're going to be talking about something that is affecting all of us, like honestly the whole world that's affecting quite literally, and that is climate change. And you're probably like, um, what? <laughs> like climate change? I thought you guys were history of medicine and women's health podcast, which is true. That is exactly what we are and exactly why we are talking about climate change today because the changing of our planet specifically affects pregnant individuals as well in some shocking ways. So it's something we wanted to touch on a little bit and explore and learn more about ourselves and teach you guys at the same time. So before we get into it, Alicia, do you know anything on this topic? Not know much. I know very little, in fact. Maybe That's okay. nothing. <laughs> you know, I maybe do know nothing at in, all. <laughs> maybe nothing. I have heard of like certain places and the effects of like climate change on the maternal health in those places. But I wouldn't mm. say I know any specifics. And I think that's what I'm excited to learn most about because I just like can't speak much to it. And I don't want to say anything given yeah. that I don't know much. <laughs> Fair enough. I didn't know literally, I knew literally nothing before I researched this episode. So we're all learning together. So let's just jump into it then. Let's do it. <laughs> Yay. Doo -doo -doo. All right. So let's start off talking about what is like the climate crisis to begin with, because I feel like it's talked about in social media, like a good amount, but that doesn't mean we all have the same knowledge level. Like we all consume different parts of media. We all know different things about what climate change is and what this crisis is. And, but not all of us know, like maybe what the history of it was, how they discovered these things that are happening and what this means. So We'll do a quick climate change history. So starting in 1938, this was the first time that there was proof of climate change. So there was an engineer who was collecting data from over 100 weather stations across the world. And he found that global temperatures had risen 0.3 degrees Celsius over the last 50 years. So this was like the first proof that there was rising global temperatures across um, like the whole planet. And then he kind of predicted like, hmm, maybe this has to do with fossil fuels because like industrialization had happened, you know, recently when it was the 1930s. So he was like, maybe this has to do with the rising temperatures, but he had no way to technically prove that at that point. And also a lot of people like were like, no, that's, that's not it. We love our factories. Like, no worries. They're like, yeah, yeah. We believe that the earth's like, temperature went up because you have that proof. But the reason why, no. So it wasn't until 20 years later in 1958 that Dr. Charles Keelings studied the um, CO2 levels of the earth for five years. And he found that the levels were rising. And at this time they're like, hmm, maybe it is, maybe this does have to do with like factories and burning things and fossil fuels. Let's we'll talk about it a little bit more later, but they were like, hmm, interesting. So now we have like a little more evidence that there is higher CO2 levels and CO2 is like one of those greenhouse gases that the media talks about a lot that is causing that is causing this climate change. Um, so he found that the levels were rising. And then a few, and then 20 years later, again, did the next big step in discoveries where scientists actually began to drill into the ice in, in, our, in Antarctica, which is cool because basically they would pull up like these chunks of ice 
And ice, you know, is obviously solid water, but doesn't mean it's like perfectly solid all the way through. So sometimes there are little bubbles of air in the ice. They're able to study the bubbles of air from the ice that they had mined in it in Antarctica. Oh, that's yes, cool. actually so cool. And so that's they were able to sick. see what the atmosphere was like at that period of time from the ice. Isn't that crazy? So that's they were able crazy. to yeah, they were able to study like thousands and thousands of years worth of like atmospheric data and they did find that over time like um the earth's atmosphere definitely has fluctuated like the gases in it has gone up and down and sometimes temperatures rise and sometimes they fall hence ice ages that have happened multiple times and things like that so they were like okay it's natural for these things to happen but the levels of gases in the air today is the highest it's been in over 420,000 years so like yes they fluctuate but the level that the earth's temperature has risen to because of how high co2 is is the highest it's been in oh almost half a million years so they were like hmm maybe maybe that's bad like fluctuation's good but not this like change standard then in 1985 it was discovered that there was a hole in the ozone layer at the south pole which is bad because of the ozone one protects us from the uv of the sun and from you know the sun's damage and having a big hole in it is not good for the earth it's going to lead to more warming it actually leads to more skin cancer in people since the ozone layer has gotten bigger all bad things but like what does this mean like i'm saying there's high co2 there's raising temperatures like what does that mean like why does it even matter well this is all one from the fossil fuels that human civilization has burned through our factories, through driving cars, through all of those types of things. And as these fossil fuels are being burned, they release greenhouse gases such as CO2, which um, as they rise, coat the earth and trap the heat of the earth into its atmosphere. So instead of heat dissipating into space, it's being trapped in the earth, which is not good. And this has caused a number of effects number of effects on our planet. Some are the sea levels have risen to a, at a lot higher rate than in the past. I think before they used to rise at like one like millimeter a year or something. Now it's like three, which is three times as much as it should be, which is not good. Also, the Arctic ice has shrunk a ton. I'm sure many people have seen the poor little polar bears who have nowhere to swim because there's no ice. Yeah. In the last 40 years, the Arctic ice has shrunk 40% which is crazy. There's also increased flooding in some areas and also increased droughts in others. So different areas of the planet are affected differently by this climate change. But the biggest thing is that like there's just change in weather patterns. So weather is becoming more extreme. It's just becoming like, I don't know, like bigger is not the right word, but just more extreme. Basically, it all ends depending on where you live. Like the weather's not going to be the same. We can't be like, oh, climate change causes flooding for the entire world because that's not true like it's just dependent on where you live and then on because of that also affects our food supply so getting more into like how are humans affected by climate change there's a lot of different things and that's like why we want to talk today is like why how are we being affected by climate change on the level of our health because you know alicia and i are going to be doc alicia is a doctor as of this time i'm a doctor <laughs> oh yes i'm a doctor that should have been our first thing we said is that Alicia is a doctor. I have one more month, guys, but Alicia is a doctor. So this is important <laughs> to us. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, very important to us. Yes, yes. Us being doctors is important. Also, we care about your health and our health and why climate change affects that. So why do all these things affect humans today? Well, there's a large, you know, range of things that large range of ways this is affecting people. Um, particularly climate change really affects communities of color who live in like really risk prone areas that already deal with a lot of pollution and that pollution is being even is even worse now because of climate change. Um, people on all ages of the, or all the people on both sides of the age spectrum are highly susceptible to changes in temperature and emergencies. So kids are really it's susceptible to temperature and like really high temperatures. And elderly people are really susceptible to if there's an emergency because of severe weather, they're not as able to leave their homes as quickly. They need a lot more assistance. So that puts them a lot, in a lot more danger. And then also low-income communities are often in areas that have high risk of flooding and pollution. So those things, of mm -hmm. course, get worse with climate change. So these, all of these groups of people are really negatively impacted by climate change. And then more specifically, 
I want to talk about pregnant patients today because, because we are women's health podcast, maternal health is very interesting and important and is really strongly affected by climate change. And before we get into any specifics, I do want to say that it's super important to note that people of color, people with disabilities, LGBTQ pregnant individuals are all negatively impacted by the climate crisis way more than white pregnant individuals are. And that's, you know, because of things I already mentioned with high risk areas, low income areas, just when you already have one thing going against you, it's intersectionality of oppression, basically. And climate change is part of that as well. So as we got into, t we're going to get into talking about why climate change affects pregnant people. And Alicia, do you have any like guesses, like as to like, what about climate change is specifically affecting like pregnant individuals? I was thinking about this because I, I don't exactly know. I have two guesses. One okay. is at like a very specific level. Like I feel like climate change, like changes just the environment in which you're living and like that can just affect a baby like that's gestating that's the first yeah. thought I had like if you're living in a place that has a lot of air pollution or something you're like mm -hmm. at risk like you're just living like in this area that like is not healthy but yeah, the other thought sure. that I had that's more like meta is that I feel like climate change is one of those environmental stressors that just has like an impact on people's bodies at large. And mm -hmm. like when you're living in a, like a world that has like higher stress levels, like that just inherently, it's like the idea of like minority stress, like living with like yeah. an elevated level of stress all the time, like does affect your health. Um, yeah. So that was like a thought that I had, but I guess that's more like globally, like how does climate change affect everyone? I feel mm -hmm. like it affects pregnant patients with, in terms of like their ability to like carry babies to term or like the birth weight of their babies, like things like that. Yeah. I don't know of yeah. any like specific like deformities or like, um, like teratogens necessarily, but I'm sure mm -hmm. there are some of those too. Yeah. I mean, those are all good points and definitely all apply for sure. Basically, I guess everything we'll talk about going forward, which is basically just going to be the couple ways that pregnant people are affected by climate change, like definitely can apply to all people and individuals. But I have like specific studies and, and statistics that affect why the pregnancy itself is affected. Um, but like she said, like it's, it's very much like a global thing. Like if it's not just the pregnant people who are affected because of this like one thing, like anyone's going to have issues. Um, so with that, I have like a couple bullet points basically of some main topic areas that affect these patients. So starting with one, which is extreme weather changes. So I mentioned that climate change has resulted in a lot of different, excuse me, climate change has resulted in a lot of different new weather patterns. I know personally myself, I feel like I've noticed it just in where I live. I'm like, the weather gets crazy sometimes now. Like this was never like this growing the up. The weather is crazy. We don't have spring anymore. Like no, we I, were kids, it's we okay. Honestly, spring. spring is my least favorite season. I'm okay with it. Same. I don't like spring. Me too. <laughs> I'm, I'm a fall. My allergies are horrible. <laughs> yeah, I just it's. But like, still, spring the is fact just that the worst. Have fall. it is kind of a problem. Yeah, yeah like we should have spring. Living in Michigan, like it's a four season state, and now it's a three season <laughs> state. It's weird. It's a three season state, and like I'm glad <laughs> they got rid of the worst season, but like that's still bad. <laughs> yeah, Sorry yeah. To all like of you I don't like want spring. winter to be longer, but I'm not mad. There's no spring, but there should be spring. So yeah, weather is just getting crazy. Climate change has resulted in a lot of severe storms with really high heat waves, lots of flooding like I'd been earlier. And also wildfires are like going crazy now. And so all of these things, like if you're having severe weather, it's going to affect your ability just to kind of live your life, which you kind of mentioned. Like if you are having flooding, then you can't really leave your house. If you're having wildfires, you might have to evacuate your home. If you're having high heat, like it's hard to go outside or maybe your AC broke and it's hard to be in your own home. Like it's just affecting your everyday life. And for one, one thing that's pivotal in this is that pregnant patients have so many doctor's appointments, so many, like in the beginning of pregnancy, you're going like once a month and then you start going like every couple of weeks and then you're going every single week. And like all these appointments are not just for silly giggles and laughs. Like some of them, maybe like you can miss maybe a couple, but don't because like a lot of them are to check up on you and the baby and to make sure things are fine and get the right testing done. And 
make sure you're taking the right medication, things like that, to make sure that you and baby are safe during pregnancy. And so if you're having these extreme weather things and you can't get to those appointments, like that is already going to cause an issue for like the baby in the pregnant person's life. Um, yeah. And then as a part of severe weather, another big thing is the high temperatures. So if you're having like a huge heat wave, that's going to cause a lot of negative things to happen to the body. I mean, like, like I said, kids already are really affected by heat. Elderly people are also really affected by heat in general, but more specifically pregnant patients are really prone to dehydration. So if the body cannot cool off and you're becoming more and more dehydrated mm. because of high heat. This is really dangerous for a pregnant patient because they can go into kidney failure pretty easily. It also re results okay. in preterm birth, low birth weight, and infant death. And one study was actually re really interesting. It was done during a heat wave, and it showed that the risk of preterm birth is actually 16% higher during heat wave days than non-heat wave days. Oh, which is wow. crazy that goes up so that much makes sense then, though that makes so much sense because like when you have your body's in like such in just -term contractions you're yeah. like you give like a liter of yeah the first thing you do like, is like have you drank mm -hmm. enough water today like let's yeah. give you some fluids yeah so Dang. it goes up a ton and then more specifically every degree of fahrenheit that it goes up it's a five percent increase in preterm birth risk so like each degree wow. higher it gets hotter it gets the more likely you'll go have preterm birth which is really bad preterm birth is not good um so that's pretty wild and then also during heat wave days there's an increased rate of stillbirth by 46 percent oh my god yeah which is terrible and so sad and so these are terrible statistics and then of course like in in the united states specifically the hottest areas of the country are in the south and the southwest and in the west and also within these areas of the country are some of the largest populations of black and Hispanic patients. So these patients that are already going through a lot of disparities are having this on top of it, the heat waves are even worse in a lot of regions where mar marginalized patients already live, which is important to note. All right. So another big thing that um, affects these patients is increased or increased susceptibility to infectious diseases. And this is because of a couple different things. One is bugs, <laughs> literally just bugs, because there are some bugs that carry disease. And if you had to guess, what are those bugs? Mosquitoes. Alicia? Mosquitoes. Yeah. Mosquitoes and ticks are like known for carrying. If you live in Michigan, you know that if you get a tick, you're at risk for Lyme disease. And that's just common knowledge. And then if you live more in the South of the United States, you have like mosquitoes that might harbor more diseases and you know that too. And so that's an issue because as seasons begin to change, like we just said that spring doesn't really exist anywhere where we live. Um, seasons are changing and some seasons are lengthening. And so if you have a summer that's being lengthened and you're having increased rainfall, it's going to result in more ticks and mosquitoes breeding and they're existing for longer in these regions than they usually like have in the past. And these blood, little blood suckers love to do exactly that. They love to suck blood. And this is super bad because ticks and mosquitoes are what we call vectors, which means basically just means that like they're able to transmit diseases. Like we were saying, like vectors is the technical medical sci scientific term, I guess, for this. So they can transmit th these diseases. And some of the illnesses that these vectors carry are very, very high risk for pregnant patients. And so a couple important ones are one Zika virus, which I feel like was in the news like a lot when it was discovered. It was a huge thing, like people like telling people not to travel and until they figure out what was going on, because Zika virus can cause a baby's brain to be underdeveloped calling or causing microcephaly, which is not good because if your brain is not developed, then you cannot have the same function as people with fully developed brains. And so that's a really high risk thing to be exposed to when you're pregnant. So Zika virus, very bad. There's also dengue fever, which can compromise the immune system and can put the body at even higher risk. Also, malaria is transmitted through mosquitoes, and this can also affect the function of the placenta and result in miscarriage. So malaria isn't in the United States, but is in a lot of other countries. And so if you're having a change in mosquito season, that's going to increase that risk of those diseases. Also, as flooding becomes more common, the risk of dirty drinking water also increases because if you're having mm -hmm. flooding and you're not able to, like, if things mix with the drinking water or if just because of extreme weather, you're not able to have facilities that clean the water as well as they used to. Like, these are all things that are going to result in drinking water not being as clean as it should. 
and that's going to result in more GI illnesses. So illnesses that are causing people to like have diarrhea, to vomit, to be dehydrated, which is the same thing as with the heat. If you're dehydrated, you're going to have a really high risk for preterm birth and preterm losses or just loss of the fetus in general. So GI illnesses, not good. And that's a big risk of not clean drinking water. And at baseline, 1 billion people across the whole planet do not have access to safe drinking water. And then it's even increasing at like a rapid rate because of the climate crisis. So pretty wild. A lot of things right there. But a lot of infectious diseases basically that are coming from just like the environment itself that you're living in. Like those are things that you can't really avoid depending on where you live. But yeah. And then adding on to that, there's even more illnesses that can cause issue. And that what the next one mostly being foodborne illnesses. So for the same reason that drinking water is at risk for not being as clean or to the quality that it should be, food has the same risk because as it becomes harder for companies and transportation, things like that to keep healthy foods and like foods that are at the correct level of cleanliness, I guess, in distribution, um, if that quality and like quantity of good food decreases, people who already experience food insecurity, which is at baseline, an issue for pregnant patients, because if you have food insecurity, then you're not getting the right nutrients you need. If you're not getting the right nutrients you need, then your baby is at risk for a lot of defects. So defects of the cleft palate, which is your mouth. There is transposition of the great arteries and then tetralogy of Fallot, which are diseases of the heart, like congenital things that you need full on heart surgery for as a baby to fix. Spina bifida, which is a like a disorder of the spine and the encephaly, which is you're born out of brain. So these are all like really high risk things that can happen if you don't have the right nutrition while you're in pregnancy, which is already baseline issue for patients experiencing food insecurity. If you add the climate crisis on top of this, you don't have access to these foods because of what's happening in your area and only the good foods are going to the really expensive areas. It's even amplifying this food insecurity crisis to begin with. Additionally, if you don't have the right food, there's not just risk to the baby, but there's risk to the person who is pregnant as well. So gestational diabetes is something that's very common in pregnancy for people who experience food insecurity. And this is basically just diabetes that happens during pregnancy. Like you can have diabetes before pregnancy and then continue to have it throughout your pregnancy, but some people develop it in pregnancy. This is not good. It's not good for you or the baby. It's very unsafe. It can get really scary. Um, and then also high blood pressure, which is also something that's really scary because that can lead to preeclampsia and eclampsia, which you have seizures and these things can be more high risk if you don't have the right nutrients and food that you should be eating throughout your pregnancy. So, uh, scary. Also, <laughs> <it's>, <laughs> I know. Ooh, it makes it's me scary. nervous just talking about it. Um, also, along the lines of food, like as you have extreme weather and like I said, like these storms are taking down power and transportation lines and food is more likely to spoil too. Like if you have a refrigerator that goes out because of an extreme weather and you have no way to store your food in a safe, cool way and your food spoils or operations to ensure food safety in your area is spoiled, you can't get that. And for some reason you're consuming spoiled food, like that itself has food born illnesses in that. And so, you know, everyone has experienced like getting food poisoning because you ate something old and like 30 minutes later you feel like crap. But in pregnancy, mm-hmm. there's some really high risk things. So listeria is a really oh, bad yeah. food born illness that can result in a lot of bad things for the baby. And that's like one of the reasons that moms aren't supposed to have like raw this or that or not supposed to have like lunch meat and things like that. But if you're consuming that because you have food insecurity, and that's going to be high risk for your baby. So, oh, and then lastly, with on this like same food topic, if you don't have the right nutritional supply and healthy water sources, then you can also affect the milk supply of the breastfeeding person, which puts the newborn at risk. So if you're breastfeeding a newborn, then, and you don't have that breast milk because of food insecurity or water insecurity, then that baby is at risk for like nutritional deficiency and just literally starvation. If you have no other way to get them food and your breast milk isn't working, then that's also bad. <laughs> so um, I feel like that's True. the I worst. That's, that. Yeah. 
Yeah. So really, we have a lot of things that have to do with like common illnesses that people already experience, but they're just getting worse is like kind of the point. Like the things that are happening already happen to people, but climate change is just like amplifying them. And to add on to that, the last point I want to make is the issue of like air pollution. And of course, like air pollution, if you live in a highly polluted area, whether it's the city you live in or you live near factories in a certain part of your city, like all these things are contributing to air pollution, which is going to cause more of respiratory infections. If you have asthma, it's going to flare it more. And if you have asthma in pregnancy, it's already a little bit more dangerous. And so these are already issues that you can experience. And then because of climate change, another big air pollution issue is wildfires now, because wildfires are putting all of this smoke into the atmosphere that contains a ton of different gases that you shouldn't be breathing in. Also fine particles, like little baby little specks of smoke that can like get into your lungs and it's really unsafe for you. And wildfires have a ton of really negative effects on pregnancies. Studies have shown there's a super strong association between wildfire exposure and low birth weight. And then also just like the psychological distress, which Alicia, you kind of mentioned when I asked you like, oh, what do you think is going on in the first place? Psychological distress is a huge thing for wildfires alone, like damage to homes and Getting to work can cause higher levels of depression, anxiety, even PTSD, which are all already connected to an increase in birth complications and pregnancy loss and preterm birth and all these, all of these things. And not just wildfire, but any extreme weather. If you're experiencing hurricanes or flooding and you lose your home or you lose your job because you can't do this or that, like that's going to contribute to stressors. That's going to be amplified even more. Like I said, the point is that everything is amplified because of climate change. So those are like the main like four things I really wanted to touch on today. So one is like the extreme. The first one was the extreme weather and how that's affecting most specifically like heat waves. Then the illnesses due to infectious diseases because of like bugs and the unclean water and then foodborne illnesses and food insecurity and then air pollution because of wildfires. So those are like four big things that are affecting um, maternal and like fetal health basically today. And so obviously this is an issue bad and it's kind of scary because like climate change seems so out of our control it seems so like otherworldly almost <laughs> like it just see like it's it's daunting because it's so much that's like literally happening and we don't know like what can i what can me the lay person do like i don't work in climate stuff i don't know like that's not me but obviously the things that we can do to try to mitigate climate change like drive less and participate in eco-friendly initiatives and like this and that within your community, but like, that's still hard. And like, we're all doing the best we can, but more specifically, like, what can we do about this like maternal health crisis that goes hand in hand with climate change? And so I was reading about like, is there anything being done, like any initiatives? And so there are some initiatives that health and climate organizations are trying to implement. There's actually a proposal made to Congress, which I don't know if it was passed or not, but there was like a very drawn out plan really detailing like what can we do about maternal health and climate change and one thing they really wanted to look at was identifying climate change risk zones which already exist so like you were kind of saying that alicia like some areas are really affected by climate change more than others and more specifically they wanted to identify risk zones for pregnant patients specifically so like pregnant patients in this area are really high risk for effects of climate change and then People in those zones would be able to have additional fundings for community-based and local departments to support like maternal health services. And so that was something that they proposed would be like a great change to have. Also, something that's been proposed is increasing access to virtual visits. So if like you're if transportation is a really big issue for you, then virtual visits is a great way to make sure you're still getting the right care and at least being able to talk to a provider. But of course, like if you already don't have access to phones or internet and virtual visits, and that's not really helping a lot. And then also family planning services, because if you can benefit from like being able to, to decide when is right for you and your family to become pregnant in a, at a time that is safe for you and your family, especially if you are experiencing things due to climate change or whatever, honestly, then family planning is a great way to help mitigate those risks. But these are all things that are being done at like the government level and organizational level. Like we are not, we are not those people. Like we can call for raising awareness. So these, these organizations do this. We can vote for people who care about these issues so that they get changed at these like national levels. But like, what can we do? What can I do? What can Alicia do? What can you do listening? Like, what are things that, you know, someone who are pregnant, who is pregnant or you are pregnant 
these are some things that you can do. So one, if you live in an area with an increase in natural disasters or severe weather, you can make a plan through OB for like safe delivery. So knowing like how you're going to get to your delivery center, where the nearest one is, signs of labor, things like that. So that if you're there, there is a natural disaster or severe weather in your area, you know, like how can you ensure the best health for you and your soon to be child? Also, if there's an increase in mosquitoes in your area, be sure to use EPA approved insect repellent or like use mosquito netting, things like that to ward off mosquitoes if possible. If the air quality is bad due to wildfires, their advice is to evacuate, which I feel like seems kind of obvious and it always is an op- isn't always an option for people. Um, so definitely do like what you can in that situation and lean on your resources. And then of course, if you're experiencing a heat wave, just be sure to like drink lots of water, take lots of breaks, like go to an AC area when you can, like do what you can to cool yourself down. Like don't, if you have a way to mitigate being hot in a heat wave, then do whatever you can to like achieve that i guess Stay hydrated yeah yeah just drink your water just carry a lot of water around with you and then yeah so those are some tips the internet had i kind of wanted to like brainstorm a little alicia like what are things that we can do we're about to be OGYNs in the month and a half like starting in the hospitals what are things that we can do to and talk to our patients about in terms of climate change the thousand yard question. stare like ugh. I mean, I think, you know, the thing that's interesting that I was thinking about throughout this episode is that while you were talking, I was like, oh, this is a really good reminder of our globalized world, which sounds silly to say, but like, I think in our field, like in our training, because we're in training now, we're so Mm -hmm. focused on our community and our like niche area But talking about climate change, like, really reminds me that, like, our world is very globalized and the effects of climate change are being seen by us. I mean, like, even in the last 10 years, we've, like, experienced the differences, but they haven't, at least to my knowledge, caused a direct correlation to my health. But Mm -hmm. like the women living in India, I'm sure have experienced like active change that is affecting their health. And so it's tough because when I'm thinking of like how I'm going to talk to my patients, I think climate change is something that's kind of insidious. It like sneaks up on Mm -hmm. you and how it's affecting patients. Um, And so like, I think my patients are experiencing their day-to-day lives. They're not thinking about climate change. They're thinking about well, they're not like, yeah, the rising temperatures are really affected they, me. <laughs> yeah. Right, exactly. Like they're, they're thinking not thinking about, about like, that. Their day-to-day lives. But I guess like in thinking of what could be affecting the patients that we're gonna be seeing in the like Chicago area, I can imagine mm-hmm. like food insecurity is a big one heat waves are like going to be a thing. Um, yeah. Getting to, getting to visits just generally, I think like expanding virtual care is one positive that came out of the pandemic. So like seeing how we can like work with our institutions to improve that I think is like helpful knowing the local resources for like how to help mitigate food insecurity um, Mm -hmm. is something how, like, are there any safety nets? like programs to help connect patients with insurance or have them get some kind of insurance for a short period of time. Um, yeah. Just those things. Cause like pregnancy is such a vulnerable time and it's also such a great time for change and like making change. Yeah. But it is. it's like the it's most really hard. time someone spends with the doctor almost in their life sometimes. Right. But then it's, it's also great time for difficult. <laughs> to get that care or that same like level of involvement from the medical team, like literally immediately postpartum. So I think being really intentional, like if you're a healthcare provider thinking about this and like, you know, listening to this thinking, and we're so open to hearing from you about the like little changes that we can make within our communities based off of the needs of our patients And I think something that this episode is going to remind me of is thinking of like, how are the problems that my, what are the problems that my patient population is facing 
And Mm -hmm. how is climate impacting that? But it's tough because it's all, I think, about expectant management, like kind of just like giving a good like overview of the possible things that could go wrong, giving the patients an understanding of like when they need to come in and when they need to call their doctor um, and helping them know and empowering them. But yeah, for sure. It is very boots on the ground kind of work and it's not always correlated to climate yeah, change. I agree. Like, like I said, like I don't really think about climate change that much. Like, yeah, I'm like, yeah, the weather is weird, but I'm not like, why is it, how is it personally affecting like me and my asthma? Like, it's not like something I'm currently thinking about. Like the only time I've really thought about like air, how air pollution is like affecting my asthma is when I traveled to India and that was like a lot more apparent. And so, like you said, like, I don't think patients are thinking about it, but I agree. It's like, just because climate change is just amplifying the insecurities a lot of patients already face with food and with water and transportation, things like that. Like that is just what we need to focus on is like, where do patients already have struggles in their social determinants of health and how can we help them be connected with the right resources um, now so that when climate change does become something that's like on the top of their mind, like maybe something did happen in their area and maybe there was a flood or there was a heat wave or Maybe there was like a crazy polar vortex or something like they have the resources they all they need before that happens. And so I agree with you, like personally for us, like moving to a new city and a new state and having to like learn a whole new city's needs and finding out like what, you know, like you said, like what are the resources even is going to be a learning curve for us. But I think that's like the biggest thing. And then like I think your point about the global part of it's interesting and that like this is like a very much a global health issue and I think something that's interesting about global health is like how can things that we do on a community-based level like also like become more broad to more of a global standpoint I guess because like there are things you can do in a different country and that affects larger communities that you can also do like at home in your small community and it's all tied together as like a chain of events so something to consider and think about and I'm glad we talked about this topic because it's something I haven't really thought about. And now it's making me really want to look into what the resources like in Chicago are for patients and learn more about that. Because that's something that's like hard to do if you're a resident and you have a million other things to do. And like that's not might not be the top of your mind, but it's so important for your patients still. So looking forward to doing that. And so I think with that, we're going to end this episode. So if you guys like this discussion and want to talk more about maybe like things like this and climate change or our fun little history things and go, go ahead and subscribe to the podcast and whatever your favorite podcasting app is. And also on YouTube because we're on there now too. And then you can also leave us a rating and review Apple podcasts and Spotify are great places to do that. Yes, and you can also follow us on social media and check out our website for our show notes, sources, merch, all the things that's from skirts to scrubs.com. And lastly, here's to the women who fought for us to be where we are today. And may we do the same for those who come after us. We'll see you next time. Yeah. See everyone next time. Bye.